So today we have another beautiful guest on Reiki Radio. Her name is Natalie Jasper. Natalie, I want to thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm so excited, looking forward to having a conversation with you. Yeah, so am I. I'm really looking forward to this um, for all of our Reiki practitioners and teachers listening because you wanted to have a discussion around deepening our practice. And I think this is an amazing conversation to have, especially in these times that we're living in. So I just want to point out that you are a Reiki master teacher, and um, we will get into different aspects of your work and books that you've published and authored. But first, could you just give us a little bit of background of how you even got connected to Reiki, how you started your practice, what led you here? Absolutely. So I started my Reiki practice basically thanks to Google. It sounds very strange, but uh, my background is in advertising. I was a copywriter. I started this new job and I always been a little bit of an anxious person. So I had nothing to do the first weeks and I Googled healing and Reiki came up. So I was like, oh, what is this? So I started to read about it and that's how I found my first class. And that first class, I have to confess, was very disappointing yeah. because again, I didn't have a lot of money. It was like the mid 2000s, New York had like four Reiki masters. You couldn't find them online easily. And this person gave me the class in probably was four hours. Mm. Uh, she was reading her notes while doing the attunement uh-huh. and gave me a little printed certificate and just taught me everything, how to place my hands on someone else. She never talked about self-healing or anything. So I left there and I also came with a very naive vision to Reiki. I had the idea I would be like super girl, I would touch people and heal them. So again, my vision was very naive and I found this teacher who probably was also very young and you know, she probably, that was probably her first class. So Google brought me to Reiki and to a weird experience of Reiki, but it kept nagging me in my head that there was something else to this experience. And so a couple of years after that, I did uh, my, like a Reiki one, Reiki two combo weekend. Mm -hmm. And that experience was really like, it melted my heart. Like it was really fascinating. And that's how I started. And that was, that class was like 12, 13 years ago. The first one was 15. Yeah. That's really interesting because I had a similar experience. The very first class that I took, um, you know, I had the same experience of, still being curious and wanting to learn more. And I went on to study with other people as well. So I have to ask you about this because we talked a little bit about it in the background. And I think it's good for a lot of people, whether they may have had a similar experience, a class where they left and they're not sure if there's more to get or people who are looking for teachers. So could you talk a little bit about the importance of having like a full body training? And do you have any recommendations for how you to find a teacher that um, maybe is well suited for what your personal goals may be? I think think that's a great question because we all have very different approaches to Reiki. So some of us, you know, we need a little bit more of a ritual. Some of us, I'm like a Muji store, right? I need a very simplistic body-based approach. So I think the first thing it's, it's talk to this person. Don't just sign up online because they have a beautiful website. So really reach out with an email ask them what the curriculum curriculum is, ask how many years they've been teaching. If I had asked that question, I would have saved myself the first class, right? And yes, it's true, you become a Reiki master with a certification, but experience like in everything else makes such a difference. Like, and as you study Reiki, you'll see it, every year your practice changes very much. So you want someone who not only that with experience, they can guide you when you have questions or you make mistakes. So again, years of experience is very important. Uh, you may want to check the lineages. If you work with chakras, again, you want probably a more Western lineage to integrate it with your chakra practice. If you do martial arts or a very simple person that wants something more grounded, more simple, you may want to go with a traditional Japanese lineage, which is, it's, it's more like simpler. And for me, in my way, I think in very human, right? It's very like daily life based. It's not, the other one has more rituals or more magic. So again, you have to know who you are and reach out to these teachers. But again, years of experience. Uh, also, you may want to teach with someone, uh, train with someone who has trained with different teachers. Uh, the gift of having trained with different teachers in my occasion, my experience is that I have a probably more open vision of what Reiki is. Yes. And you realize that at the core, it's all the same practice that what changes are words 
or some concepts. Mm -hmm. So you're more open-minded as well. And, and you train your students in a more open-minded so they don't go out there and they, they don't doubt like, oh, someone is doing something differently. I'm doing it wrong. Right. right? So I just experience an open-minded teacher and knowing yourself and knowing what you need as well. Yeah, oh, I love that. I couldn't agree with that more. And that was my experience as well. I trained with several different people, partly to satisfy my curiosity. I'm really curious to understand the ways people approach Reiki and the different lenses, the different practices, just as you mentioned. And I too, I feel like it really helped me a lot to learn more from traditional lineages as well as more westernized. So I completely understand but one of the things I wanted to ask you about, also you mentioned when we spoke before, is Reiki as an awareness practice. And I thought this was huge because a lot of people think of it only as this thing of like lay on hands, help someone else balance their energy. So I really love that you um, talk about it being an awareness practice. And can you speak a little bit more about that and how this came through for you? Absolutely. So I think what happens also when you train with different people and you find your lineage, you yes. stick to it, right? Because the other thing, even though you want to explore a little bit, you need to find your style and then deep and deep and deep and into it. So what happened with me is Western Reiki felt good, but didn't feel, it didn't feel me. So I started checking and I went to a Japanese traditional lineage and I still work with my mentor for five years. And what happened when you practice the same things, you go deeper into them. So for example, if you just do hands-on healing on others, right, then you're thinking that you're channeling energy, there is that limited depth that you can go to it. So talking about being open-minded, uh, we see a lot of time as Reiki as I'm sending Reiki or this energy outside of us. But if you go to Japan, Reiki means spiritual energy, anything, everything, rocks have Reiki, right? If you didn't have Reiki, you will be dead. So right. you will be at least in Japanese tradition and in Japanese language. And that's where this Sometimes we fight, but it came from Japan, right? Mm -hmm. So like when you start being aware that you are Reiki, like it's part of you, you realize this is not really about channeling or healing others. This is really about like developing awareness that we are spiritual energy. Yeah. So the first thing we really bring it to the self, like for example, hands-on healing becomes a completely different experience, right? I'm using my hands not to channel this outside energy that will heal me. I'm using my hands to remember you know, that spiritual energy and feel it in my body yes. and to also align mind and body because the other extreme, and I'm really good at that one, is going to this very spiritual world and forget the body, right? Mm -hmm. So we leave, but you know, the idea of Reiki is aligning mind and body because we're having this human experience, trauma, emotion, all the craziness that drives us nuts is in yes. the body. So being aware of that and, and bringing mind and body together through the hands it's a very different experience than just I'm placing my hands and sometimes I get distracted and I hope, you know, everything goes well. So it's, you know, and it's just the way we approach to it can have so many nuances. Yeah. And the idea someday is also to be okay. Some days I place my hands on someone and, you know, honestly I had a rough day and I'm like, mm. so it's also how you can just hold the space and forgive yourself. So, you know, yeah. what it is. And that also is part of the awareness. So I think everything Reiki practice when it becomes an awareness, you bring a lot more compassion, forgiveness, and also, you know, you, you're more aware of everything. Sorry, that probably was very redundant. No, no, it, it's a beautiful answer. And it reminds me of why I have fallen in love with the practice. You know, I talk about exactly what you said a lot on the podcast and how our practice comes through and how we are being. And it's not just, you know, when we're in a Reiki session or in a class, but it's how we are being out in the world, how we are just being in our own space. But you make me think of, and I have to ask you about these too, um, the different tools within the system, because I think they all reveal these layers that you're talking about, bringing us back into our true nature, right? So whether it's the Gokai or the symbols or hands on, hands off, either way, it all comes back to helping us come in deeper into this awareness, right? So I have to ask, how did this really um, inspire you? I mean, because you, I just want people to know, you actually went to Japan to study at a monastery. So what was it about this practice that made you go like, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm gonna go to Japan, <laughs> I'm gonna study. Could you talk a little bit about what inspired that and what you learned? Yes, I, it's funny, I, I come so that you know my background is Belgian Spanish. So my family on the Spanish side is very Christian, right? So I grew up with a very Judeo-Christian background. 
And what happened to me when I first approached Reiki, it's I had that background. I'm not religious, but I had that background of understanding. So a good example is the precepts, right? When I approach to them, um, for me, and again, it's because of my culture, this may not happen to other people, they felt like commandments. Do not get angry. Do not worry. So I'm a Scorpio. I get angry. I am very fiery. And it goes away very fast. So I continuously felt my practice wasn't really working because I still worried. I still get angry, even though it would last like a lot less. Mm-hmm. And it was really a, like a lack of understanding. Then one day something happened really from practicing and practicing. And that's why we talk about awareness. The more you do something, it clicks in your energy, in your mind. It changes like, oh, these are actually tools for meditation, right? So do not worry to sit and say, okay, why am I worried? Let me listen to my mind, to my body. Oh, I'm worried because of this. So I was able to let go of layers of anger and worry. And you realize the precepts are actually a guidance and a meditation tool, right? But that's a very Japanese point of view. Even with the symbols, I remember when I first uh, took that class, that combo class with the symbols, I'm like, oh, they're like phone numbers, right? <laughs> I just dial to Korea. I dial like home transition. And then that's it. I do distance, right? And I was telling someone like, he didn't understand. I'm like, come on, they're like phone numbers. International codes for the distance one. And then you realize, no, they're not that. They're meditation tools. And then you see the symbols as external. And then you actually become one with the symbols, right? Because you are earth, you're heaven. So when I started realizing all of that, I'm like, oh, you know, what else am I missing? And then my teacher, Francine, he's wonderful. He's trained with mountain monks in Japan. But then I was teaching, like Franz says, I'm like, I cannot I have to have a direct experience of this, right? I cannot be a teacher and be in repeating an experience and yes, I'm having to a limited point in my practice. So I took a tiny carry on bag. And because I don't know if you know, Japan, everything is tiny and I had to take like 300 trains to get to a monastery. So I spent six weeks with my carry on bag traveling to Japan. And then I spent three weeks at a Zen monastery. Um, We were mostly doing a Zazen, which is the Zen meditation. We did a lot of chanting and then you realize, oh, that's where the the mantra chanting comes from. And your vision just changes. It's so much, it like, I don't know if you know in Japan, they wrap everything in a hundred layers of paper, right? So if you're going to get like a candy, you have to unwrap everything. And just the fact of going to a store and seeing that you're like, oh, that's the same with a symbol. That's the same with a the precepts. There's so many layers into it. Uh, there is a meditation called Joshin Kokiyoho. Oh, it's grounding. No, Joshin Kokiyoho has 300,000 layers. So when you go to Japan and you experience it, And just by walking around, they're all so connected with nature. Your vision of Reiki just deepens. And, you know, it's just beautiful for me. Like every time I go crazy, I just, I got there as a spring to summer. So I was in the mountain and I would meditate and I will hear the snow melting and falling into the rice fields. Just that experience, like your mind stable, like a mountain, the water melting. Again, it sounds very, but it just changes your practice because you're connected with everything. It's a different point of view. Yeah, no, I think that is amazing. You just remind me because Franz is also a teacher of mine and I love um, his Reiki play days where we do a lot of chanting and, you know, all of these different practices that also are rooted in what Yusui was practicing and knew as well. And a lot of that, that the foundational practices that aren't necessarily taught in Western classes. So yeah, I think that's amazing that you had that experience and um, just how much it has opened you up, right? The awareness, how it's giving you different perspective. So speaking of that, now I want to kind of pivot into this main thing we wanted to talk about today was how we deepen our practice, because there are a lot of practitioners who, like both of us experienced after the first class are like, okay, so what? <laughs> so for people who may already be practitioners and do want to deepen their practice, what are some tips that you have and how did you come to do that for yourself? Right. So the first tip is actually keep a beginner's mind. Mm-hmm. So when we do a certification, again, language is tricky. It's understanding that we're just getting the tools to start our journey, right? And the other thing and this is very different to a Western mind, like it's understanding that you need to repeat many times the same practice, but with awareness. So what happens with hands-on healing, I don't know if it happens to you, sometimes you go, okay, after like a month, you're just like, you know, it's it's like when you're dating someone, like after a few months, you're just like, okay, honey, I kiss you. So it's really keeping that awareness and keeping that beginner's mind, like every day would be different and just really be aware, even if it's the 
300 times you do hands on healing on yourself. So it sounds really boring, but if you pay attention, you start seeing all the layers and all that richness. I did a class the other day, I, and we were all Reiki masters, and we basically work with layers of awareness, like be aware of your hands at the same time of the body, so that you're really more into the session. Everybody's yeah. like, oh, we forgot how powerful basic hands on healing is, because also as we move into mastership, we love the big rituals, and we forget the foundational is so powerful. The, Simple tools, it just depends on awareness. Yeah. So that's the first tip. The second tip, if you have questions, reach out. So again, we're talking how to look for Reiki Master. Make sure your Reiki Master is going to be there for you after as a mentor, by email or anything, right? Yes. So that's the way, it's the best way, especially for Reiki 1. Reiki 1, sometimes we have so many questions, we jumped into a Reiki 2 class because we don't understand Reiki 1. Right. And Reiki 1 is just gorgeous if you pay attention. So reach out to a Reiki Master. If it doesn't answer. I will stay away from too many books. Every book has a very different perspective. It depends on the lineage. You can mm -hmm. check some books, but probably reach out again. They're starting to have some mentorship programs out there. So again, reach out if your master doesn't give you point the way. Join yeah. Reiki circles, but join Reiki circles that probably also work more on the self. So a lot of Reiki circles, we go and we place the hands on others, which we right. learn a lot. And then there is a discussion, I felt this or that, but join Reiki circles that maybe include some Reiki meditations and that also have a discussion probably of a, like, what is the angle today? We're going to work on softening, on not trying too hard, on non-doing. So a teacher that has a point of view and can guide you, mm -hmm. not tell you everything, but can give you the little nudge that like make you have the insight. Because the other thing is, I feel sometimes we want people to tell us what our practice is. Tell me what's my next step, right? right. Tell me what to do versus okay, why do you want to do this exercise for a week and come back to me? Mm -hmm. So I think that's another way, really having a person that gives you like the tools for you to practice and get that insight versus giving you that insight digested. But mostly sit on your bum and practice, <laughs> practice, practice, and be open-minded, journal, and just experience the practice with an open mind and an open heart. Yes. Yes. I love all of that. And you know what you bring to mind. I think this is a great message for Reiki teachers. So a lot of people, once they do their Reiki, Reiki master level training and they may think, oh, I just, you know, mimic what my teacher did. And a lot of times maybe what the teacher did, there wasn't anything to sustain, you know, the contact or to continue to develop after the class. So I always encourage people to consider teachers, consider what you feel may have been missing from your training that would have supported you more, that would have helped you deepen your practice and make sure you have that available to your students. Because just like you say, um, not all teachers are available after the class. It's like you take the class and then they're gone and you have no way of communicating with them or you know asking the questions that come up after class so i think what you're saying um hopefully the people who are teaching are considering teaching have those considerations as well and then i think also it's important again have a teacher that is very human so mm -hmm. And we we're talking about this the other day how we've made so many mistakes because again we've been practicing for many years yeah but instead of like hiding or feeling like being vulnerable and we learn from that. So there is no shame for you as a student to come up with crazy ideas because we've probably been there. And if not, we'll be like, hey, that's a new one. That's great. Let me see if we can come up with an answer. Right. So teachers who are very human, right? They're not gurus or detached. I think it's also very important that, that they're open to discuss any crazy thing that happens to you with an open mind and compassion. No, absolutely. And speaking of open-mindedness, we have to talk about this because I think it's really, really cool. And I don't know that I've spoken to anyone else who is doing this, what you're doing. So you have had an opportunity to share some of um, these practices in corporate environments. And I think this is beautiful because again, it just shows the way these tools, these practices, it's not contained to just you know, what people may think of as spiritual. This is for our everyday life. So could you talk a little bit about sharing in corporate environments and how that came about? Absolutely. So that's a passion of mine because I work most of my life in corporate environments, right? Yeah. So again, when I started with Reiki, it was very magical and it had, it didn't help me in my advertising life. I still had men down. I would be a little bit more relaxed at home, 
But as I moved towards a more awareness practice, and that I think was the big shift for me when this became more of a spiritual awareness practice versus something external. Right. I'm like, and I started learning the meditation tools and like Choshin Kokiyoho and working with the precepts. I started using it in my corporate life and it went so much better, right? Yeah. Like it changed completely the way it works. So when I left my corporate life, and I think with all the stress, and you can see, like I work in corporate in 20 years, the amount of stress just multiplied by 100. Right. So what I do have is the background of the language that I know will scare people off or not. So the way we talk about Reiki is very important when we go to corporate. So when you talk about the breathing, the ability of breathing to calm the brain, to soothe the brain, because if you think about it, it's really a connection with your emotions. When you're ex like crazy, you stop breathing. So yeah. if you explain people that relationship, listen, when you get stressed, you can breathe. When you breathe, you lower the stress. They open their mind to it. Yeah. And what I notice, if we keep the language simple about reconnecting with your body, being able to feel your emotions and release them, and this is a Japanese practice, they actually, they, people like Japanese practice, right? And we make it very internal, very human, these tools that you can use for your work to be more focused, more grounded, more centered, more relaxed. Everybody wants that. So I did some uh, corporate events in the beginning. They were like one hour events and people really liked them, but people don't have time in corporate for all this one hour and then they will be like too relaxed. Yes. And then this uh, a colleague of mine from Women Who Tribe, she does this corporate thing. And with the pandemic, she's like, oh, let's do a short 15 meditation uh, for corporate. And it's a real estate, huge corporation with 600 employees, right? And I've been doing it for months and they love it for the last two months and a half. And what is incredible, it's, it's young males mostly, young females, super entrepreneurs, super alphas, sweet as hell, beautiful people. And they yeah. really love, it's their lunch break. And they relate to it. I ask them to place their hands on their body and to feel their breath. And in 10 minutes, they go from being totally stressed to relaxed. Yeah. So sometimes we underestimate the power of our practice as well. Yes. And I, for me, my dream is obviously every corporation will have a program where we teach people, again, it's an awareness practice and then if they want to take it to a spiritual side that's okay too some of them are already asking like is there a class for this so then yeah but how can we make it more human and i think people some people want a more uh, you know more chakra more energetic healing experience and that's reiki too some people want a very deep japanese spiritual experience of enlightenment that is true but reiki can also be a very beautiful self-care practice yeah. for everyday life for everybody so again the way we present it is very important that the more accessible we make it, you know, that you don't need to dress in white or always have a sage. I love sage. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I love that. But for some people, it turned them off. So how can we keep Reiki to the simplest expression of what it is so that we include everybody else? We become more inclusive uh, to our practice. You know? Yeah. No, I, I love that. And I love because, you know, I think it opens the conversation up for a lot of people who may be, um, have it contained or restricted to a, a one small box. That's another thing too. I love um, hearing about the work that you've done in your journey, all people, because I think it helps all of us to be more open-minded about what this really is and have that curiosity to see the purpose behind um, these tools and these practices, right? I mean, it's, yeah, anyway, it's really, really fascinating. So this, because listening to you, you know, I'm sure some people are like, oh, well, how can I learn more about what she's talking about? And you've actually published a few books. So can we talk a little bit about the books that you've published and who they're for? So I published two books and I have them here. I just had them handy just in case. So the first book actually came out of my own uh, trouble meditating. So when I started like to learn the Reiki meditations, mm -hmm. I could not remember them. I'm really bad with movements and everything that is not ideas or words. Yeah. And the other thing is when I wanted to write as a Reiki, when I started like teaching and giving more sessions, everything came as advertising. That sounded really fake because yeah. that's my background, right? So I started doing some drawings and the first book is this one, Reiki as a Spiritual Practice and Illustrated Guide. So this one is really for people who want to get a lot deeper into the awareness part of Reiki, learn the meditation, and really work on themselves. So the other thing I felt is where, and I was like that too, and I still have a tendency like that. When we're Reiki practitioners, we want to give and help hold the space for others. And sometimes we don't take good care of ourselves, right? And, right. and but that also puts a lot of pressure because then we're always trying to make people feel better and we lose that space of non-doing. Right. And what we have to do is do our homework, 
really do our homework, be completely balanced and offer that energy. That's what we need to do. So that's, this book is really all about self-practice. There is nothing of practicing on other people. So you can really ground, balance, work with the precepts, learning all the stuff that I didn't learn in my first two classes. Yes. And that I learned later on with, I trained both with Deborah Flanagan in Western and Japanese and then with France. So this is, you know, so there is 10 meditations, hands-on healing protocol. Everything is very visual. Can I say something about that? I love that you created something that focuses on the self-work and, you know, this is a, another conversation that comes up a lot with different people because there is this want to help everyone else, help everyone else, help everyone else. And um, I often have to give people the example of how much we um, impact each other and influence each other, right? So just the same as someone comes into the room and they're upset and all of a sudden your mood shifts or someone is so excited and happy to see you and it like lights you up inside. So I try to get people to understand, think of the, the way you are being, the energy that you are cultivating for yourself, what you're projecting and how just your presence alone, how impactful that will be in the environments that you show up in, the people you exchange with and most definitely in session. So it would only make sense that you want to start here. And it, it's yeah. interesting that a lot of people, they have to really like make that distinction to go, oh yeah, it does make sense to work on me. So very cool that you created a book focusing yeah. on that. So I just want to ask though, you said there are a lot of illustrations in this book. So is it to help us understand the yeah. different meditations or? Yeah, it's mostly drawings because that's the other thing. I think a lot of Reiki books are very long and and they talk a lot we use words and words sometimes they mean different things according to your culture right. you know and and we can talk a lot about our own experience but when you do for example joshin kokio hands on healing every experience is very different some people hear some people see color some people have warmth so i did drawings because it felt like a very universal and also like i don't know dry bathing it's almost impossible oh, for me God. to remember you know like chan, chan. Yes. yeah so <laughs> Again, I'm, so there are drawings and what is helping to is for people who are not trained, like I can describe to them like, okay, you do this. But when you see it, a lot of people who have been practicing this meditation are like, oh, now I get it. Right. right? So it's, it's almost like a very simple how-to. And I, it's a little bit like Reiki, you know, Reiki looks deceptively simple. So this yes. book is deceptively simple. You could work right. with it many, many months and still you know, get stuff out of it. And it has very little words. It also brings a little bit, for example, for the symbols, the original Japanese meaning. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we get trapped with these names like power symbol. Right. Oh, power. Like, again, that word <laughs> is very charged. Right. You put the power of the universe here. Well, it's here. It's in yourself, right? Going yes. inwards. So just understanding, again, the Japanese context that can give you a new insight into working with the symbols. And, but as simple as possible. And it's been translated in French, German, Spanish. So I guess people like it. And so, I mean, I, but again, it came out of my own direct experience of drawing and myself just exploring this meditation. It wasn't even planned as a book. That is very, very cool. I'm smiling because all month throughout May, I've been meeting with a group of people every morning at seven in the morning <laughs> to um, go through different Reiki practices. And we have, we focused on, there was a time where we focused on just the symbols and we've also done um, Joshin Kokiho and just all of these different things. And it's, it's, a uh, it makes my heart just beam to hear, like you have this guide, this book that people can use to help them go deeper into their practice in their own space. So this one is called Reiki as a spiritual practice. And you also have though the Reiki healing handbook, right? Yes. <laughs> Which is probably Opo, like mirror, sorry, you won't see. So this one came because I had a student and uh, actually a publishing house reached out to her to do a book about Reiki and chakras. And then she reached out to me because I like, I know chakras, but you know, I'm a Reiki two person. And yes. she actually finished her master just before the book as well. But she was just like a very recent, like she felt comfortable, but she was doing her master finishing it. So we started and then I'm like, oh, but I, I do mostly traditional Japanese Reiki, right? Yes. I'm like, that's the way, how can I write? And then I'm like, hold on, why don't we do, and I approached the editorial house, like, can we do a more, like, yes, chakras, but explain them from a more open point of view of like points of exploration, awareness versus a fixing attitude. And then can we bring some Japanese backgrounds so that even if you're a Western Reiki practitioner, which is probably 90% 
of the Reiki community, right. you have an idea of the background. And also, can we make it as open possible, again, talking about being open-minded to every lineage? Yes. Because I think sometimes we get trapped into the ritual, right? So some lineages learn to do a session. You do like symbols on the chakras and the room, and then some lineages done, and then you're confused. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, when you do like the first symbol on your chakras, it's just a focusing. It's getting centered in the state, the right state of mind. So there is right. nothing wrong with doing it. There is nothing wrong in not doing it. It's just really entering that space of presence, as you beautifully said. Yes. But if we understand what the ritual is for, it's a different thing. Then you know that you can just do it your own way in your own direct experience because you understand the meaning of the ritual. It's not activating your chakra, or it may be, I don't know, because I, really, <laughs> I apologize, don't get offended, I'm not a chakra person, but it, like chakra is all about focus and presence. So that's right. what you're really creating. You're focusing your energy, you're being more present mm -hmm. through your chakras, through your body, through the whole space where you're in. And that also gives such depth to that ritual that sometimes maybe you've rushed before if you do that right. ritual, right? Right. Or in my case, a lot of times I see my students doing gasho like, ping, right? Just like, <laughs> okay, I did gasho and I'll move on to the meditation. And I did that and the Japanese monk almost hit me with a stick. It's like, there is nothing superficial in a ritual. Gasho means bringing everything together. Yes. He will say, Natalie-san, do it with your whole body. I'm like, mm. So again, everything in Reiki, even those things that we rush, can we slow them down, understanding their meaning? Mm -hmm. I bring everything with acceptance, you know? So then that transforms that very simple gesture into a meditation. Yes. So yeah. that, that book is trying to bring a little bit of that background so that, you know, no matter what kind of lineage we practice, we can go just a little deeper into every little thing by understanding or gaining that understanding that is behind. And again, I've only practiced for 15 years. So hopefully in 10 years, I'll see this book and it's still very limited, but just a tiny bit, a grain of salt to hopefully spark an insight in someone. But I think it's, it goes back to what you said before, the layers, right? Because it's interesting how, you know, we can hear things a million times, but then someone presents it with just a little, little tweak to it. And then all of a sudden the light bulb goes off for us and then we're off to revealing a new layer, right? So I think, and I really like that you keep emphasizing all lineages because I do believe as well, like as a community, we really have to be sure not to be so divisive and separating ourselves like, oh, I practice a different type. Okay, it's okay. Because, <laughs> you know, I think we lose sight of like the point of the practice when we, you know, have this separation type of um, attitude around it. So I think it's beautiful that you've created these tools and specifying that it's really, it's for all of us. And I mean, you've even gone beyond um, Reiki practitioners, because again, you're sharing even in corporate environments. So I love, it seems a lot of your message is how can we just as like humans, <laughs> as beings, use these tools to return to our true nature? And how can we reveal and be aware of how we're being so we can, it reminds me of um, like polishing, like the diamond or, you know. I, I love that. Yeah. yeah. Really polishing and, and you can see polishing the mirror in two ways like oh my god there is still so much crap in me and feel depressed yeah. or like which is probably your first reaction when you go to another layer but also it's like wow how much depth there is in this practice like I'm yes. so lucky that I can keep on going yeah sometimes yeah. I don't like what I see when I polish but <laughs> how lucky that these simple tools can have like that can bring so much information about yourself, right? Yeah, absolutely. And this is another thing you said, and I wrote it down when we spoke before, because I think this is huge for anyone, no matter where we are in our practice, is you spoke a little bit about the beauty of mistakes, right? So can you talk a little bit about that and like where we, what we can learn or how we learn, even when we do what we think was a mistake or messed up? Yeah, it's funny because it's, I probably did, I don't, and I still do a lot of mistakes in my Reiki practice, right? Yeah. So there are two gifts of mistakes. First of all, if you don't, that means that you're exploring so, and that you're open-minded. So when your teacher gives you something, if you just repeat it, afraid of doing a mistake, you will have a limited practice. It will right. probably, and again, if you want to just use Reiki for relaxation, that is okay. You don't also need to go all the way crazy deep like I go, right? Uh, but if you, sometimes just, you try, right? So like, okay, this is the hands position. What happens if I place my hand in my head? Oh, well, that doesn't feel good. Or today feels good, right? So sometimes you need to do mistakes to know that what you were thought is okay. 
or also to make the practice your own to realize it wasn't a mistake it's just a different variation so i always tell this story my i studied with deborah flanagan that was my first reiki master and she was a very compassionate beautiful teacher who got me from being completely all over the place to the right place for me to discover then my love for japanese reiki right so she told me do not practice with the fourth symbol the reiki tree symbol more than a few minutes a day you're going to lose your grounding and at that time i did understand how cool and beautiful and rich grounding was i'm like ah. so i'm like so I started meditating with the Reiki master symbol. Like, it felt so good. I will do binging, right? I will do like <laughs> half an hour. I'm like, oh my God, I'm like so high on the Reiki master symbol. My life went to, like, I lost my keys. I became emotional. It was a whole mess. Like, but you know, now I can tell you do not binge on the Reiki master symbol from direct experience. I can tell you what happens. And you know what I love? That my students, at least the more adventurous ones, they all break that rule. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they come and like, you were right, I was binging. So how can I, as a teacher, really tell you do not binge on that symbol if I haven't binge? You know, it's, it's right. so, and again, just, I think there are some mistakes you shouldn't do, like seeing you're healing someone else, mm -hmm. thinking, you know, really pushing the limits. There are some stuff that are very firm in Reiki, yeah. you know, presence trumps anything else, compassion, yes. love, those values you're holding the space, you're not manipulating energy. Those things are like non, I, there I become like, I have a quarter German, I become really like, you don't step over those lines. Yes. So those, those are the truth and those are the truth in the precepts. So I'm not making that truth myself. Right, that's exactly what I was thinking. You're saying yeah. just like abide by the precepts, right? Abide by the precepts. So mm -hmm. that is affirmed. The flexible thing is sometimes you need to explore, again, with a symbol, explore different ways. Like you're walking, can you meditate with a symbol? Oh, that was a mistake. I used the second symbol and tripped because I was completely ungrounded. Okay, you know, do not meditate with the second symbol when you're walking. So just explore a little bit. And again, also have a teacher that can guide you. Like, you know, if you're going through a very different time with the pandemics, you may want to stay with grounding exploration. Mm -hmm. But those mistakes help you understand the depth of the practice, right. right? So like, oh, I did my hands on healing watching TV. Well, that was a mistake because it didn't really work, right? <laughs> I'm, now I'm, I'm struggling with chanting. I'm really bad chanter. Like I, it's, it's, I'm, I am tone deaf. I cannot replicate sound. And so I started my 21 day marathon with Francine, with my teacher that he's doing. And the first week I was okay following the rules. Second week he started accelerating. I struggled. This week I'm like all over the place. So what I decided to do is to chant maybe very badly some days, change the pitch. So since I cannot do it well, can I explore and maybe in the way of mistakes, find something that works for me? Yes. Right? We yeah. respect an approach to the chanting, but like letting go of the pressure of being perfect and just exploring. And yeah. you were asking at the beginning, how do we deepen our practice? By exploring it with respect, you know, with gratitude, but exploring it, like pushing sometimes the limits, you know, in a respectful way. But like, what happens if I do this? Oh, no. Oh, yes. And then when you're a teacher, people come up with crazy questions, right? Like, because they are all individuals. You're going to have students and they all will have a very different question. If you haven't explored, how do you answer those questions? Right. Oh, and I love the questions. Experience. Yeah, because yeah. they make you even go deeper into your own awareness of how you perceive things that you may not have even considered yeah. prior to being asked. And I like what you're saying about the exploration. The same with chanting. I found I had a hard time connecting with until... I had to bring my consciousness down to like the hara and try to like chant from like deep within my being. And then it, it felt different. So it was a lot of play around that as well. But I want to make sure, um, just stepping back a little bit, because we didn't say how people can get your books. So could you just share how can we connect? Absolutely. To get the books? Yeah. So they, they can actually search for the books on Amazon. That's the easiest way. Okay. I discovered my guide is also in Barnes and Nobles. I don't know how. Very cool. So, but then mostly Amazon is the best way. And for English, the ebook is actually quite good version of it. Uh, for the other languages, I will go for the print is better design. Okay. Uh, this one, uh, it's available if you go for good reads and all those sites is available on Amazon and a bunch of booksellers. So you may want to just like Google the name of the book, Reiki Healing Handbook by Natalie Jasper. Okay. Alina Campos, sorry, Goldstein, that's her married name. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
So you can just Google it, it will come up. But again, Amazon is the easiest. Amazon. Okay, yeah. so Amazon is the best way. Find the Reiki Healing Handbook and Reiki as a Spiritual Practice. So both of those books are available there. So now if we can get into a little bit of what it is that people can connect with you to learn and do. I know that you are in New York. You are a Reiki master teacher. So people can come to New York to study with you or if they're there, study with you. And then what about sessions? Do you offer those as well? I offer sessions. I offer, I work mostly with people who have a meditation practice that want to deepen it. The sessions are really like meditation experience. And then yeah. I also work with people with cancer. So I, I actually enjoy very much that side of it. Um, most of my practice, probably 60, 70% is teaching. Mm -hmm. So before the pandemic, I used to teach again, a relaxation meditation Reiki class to people in a yoga studio, to a lot of young women and young men, like really wanting to relax on Sundays. I teach, I taught like Reiki circles and then certifications I teach in person. So that's something that even with the pandemic, I still maintain as an approach. One thing that the pandemic made me come up with, and I've been doing it for a month and a half, it's there is a system called Patreon. Yes. Patreon. I can never pronounce the right yeah, word. I have it too. And I'm always like, I yeah. don't know, patron. patron. Everybody <laughs> struggles with that. It's the big mystery of the universe. Like, yeah. So uh, what I created was a continuing education system. So if you, you can choose your tier, you can be a Reiki 1, Reiki 2, Reiki 3 practitioner, and you will get virtual practices. And you will get also newsletters and you have access to like over 50 meditations that are already in the back and all the back classes. And the beauty of this is we're meeting to do those exercises I was talking about. So an example, for example, we're doing Reiki 3, we're opening from the Hara bright light, but instead of just doing that, because again, there is no one to do it on. So we'll imagine someone we love and then we'll imagine someone like a politician in front yes. of us. And just notice how our energy completely changes, right? Because we're not, a lot of time when we're practicing with people, we're aware of the other person and not, we don't, we lose our center. Right. So we do exercise, everybody's like, whoa, when we brought, in my case, it was Mitch McConnell, right? So my bright light, they want to go from here. But as soon as I center it in my own bright light, it just went the way it had to. Right. And it just took Mitch McConnell with love and compassion. So we practice these little Japanese layers exercise, right? And, mm -hmm. and hopefully, and again, we get to practice together in this pandemic time, but it's something I want to keep uh, in the future, even when we open up. I have people from the UK coming in to practice. Yeah. I have people from Australia coming in to practice. So the beauty of we're doing this community and these practices, how to refresh your foundational tools, but how to go deeper into them. And I'm having so much fun. So yes, it's so interesting. I'm doing the same. So the group that I said I'm doing Reiki with every day, they're the um, part of the patron group. And it is, it's amazing how the communities we're able to create and become a part of, and it doesn't matter the distance between us. And even being with you here on the podcast, you know, we're on opposite coasts, but we get to have this discussion and share it with people that are, you know, it's global. So, so thankful for the resources and people like you who are sharing and, you know, going very deep in your personal practice so that you can gain more understanding to help other people. You know, I just, I love the, it's like a continuing to um, pay it forward. That's what it feels like in a lot of ways, just paying it forward by being in your practice. Yeah, and again, you said it too, we learn so much from our students, right? Mm -hmm. There is a moment like we can learn so much by having a personal practice, so much from having a practice only based on others, the right. ideal way to really deepen your practice is have a balance of personal and group practice. Yes. And as a teacher, keep having a mentor, but also teach, yeah. right? So, yep. in, and I'll keep it short, but I do martial arts and the beauty of the system in martial arts, first of all, for 10 years, you're a beginner. Mm -hmm. so I have two black belts, I'm still like a freaking baby. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm not even taking seriously until I have four. But the beauty of it, there is a system that the people who have four black belts bring me forward. But me as a second black belt, I have to bring the beginners on. Exactly. So yes. there is no ego, right? We all learn from the people more advanced and we bring the people that are lower because the higher sensei, the changes are so subtle. So the higher sensei is obviously teach the people who are higher up. Right. So it's, but it's such, it's not an ego base. It's just a very practical, beautiful family. We're all helping each other. Yeah. And bringing that concept to Reiki, I think is great. Like I, I you know, I, I'm so grateful for having a mentor like Franz 
And then, you know, I hope to one day be that for many people as well. And then they will be that for other people. Yes. You know, I hope to train people who are better than me. Like that's yes. my whole idea. Yes. Oh, I feel the same way. And it's like my heart beams when I get to practice with people. And that thought is what excites me. Like, wow, these people are going to go and then share. And then it just keeps multiplying to where yes. so many more of us are practicing and coming deeper into our awareness and our compassion and, you know, forgiving and our own healing. Oh, just to think of it, Natalie, makes me so excited. And it's one of those motivations that, you know, it keeps me in my practice, to be quite honest. It's just the excitement of, you know, how it all expands out. And it's not just about us, you know, that, that interconnectedness comes to my, it just, it stays as a motivating factor. And I love the way your face is glowing <laughs> with happiness right now. It's just beautiful. Like, you know, your eyes are sparkly. It's just, <laughs> you just made me very happy. <laughs> See the way we impact each other. Yes, yes. Yes. So beautiful. So Natalie, I have to tell you, I am so thankful that we had this conversation today. And I'm sure you have inspired so many people. Don't forget to go to Amazon, check out Natalie's books, but there are other ways to connect with you. So could you share your website and how we can find you on Instagram? Absolutely. So the name of my website is Dive Into Reiki. Mm -hmm. So it's just diveintoreiki.com. And then I'm pretty consistent in Instagram. So it's obviously the handle is Dive Into Reiki. And so everything has different things. The website has all the information on how you can work with me, my background, Instagram is very visual, so you're going to see a lot of crazy drawings I do when I meditate and a lot of tips and daily meditation tips as well. Yeah. And then I'm also on Facebook as Dive Into Reiki, and there I post probably like longer articles and a lot of blog posts as well. So diveintoreiki.com on Instagram and Facebook. All of these ways you can connect with Natalie. And of course, I'll have the links down in the show description so everyone can connect with you now, go deeper into their practice. And I, again, I thank you so much for being here. It was an absolute pleasure to meet you, love. Well, thank you so, so much for just having me. I it really, there are no words to express gratitude. I had a great time, but also I, it was so nice just to connect and realize like this beautiful practice together that we share like so many points of view. So I'm really grateful for being here and having connected with you. Yes. We should thank our teacher hunt friends <laughs> for, you know, all that has been shared with us so that we can too continue to pay it forward. So thank you to friends. Thank you to you, Natalie. This is to friends. Yes. <laughs> and thank you to everyone who has joined us today. We will see you next time. Thank you so much.